going to dive into it, as I said, in the next few weeks, but let's try and get us in the right headspace with where Colossia is. Because this is a letter. You know, this is a letter that Paul sent to the church in Colossia. So if it's a letter, then it was sent to real people in about somewhere between 53 and 63 AD. So real people read this. And we've got on the first slide here, now this is a broken projector. This is a not broken projector. These are projectors that this time last year we weren't looking at. So let's just be grateful that we have them. <laughs> if you can't see this one, I'm really sorry. But this is Europe. Oh, oh, this is Europe. And Colossia is down in this square down here. If I could have the next slide up. In down here. And this over here is Turkey. And that's where Colossia is. And this square here, we're just going to zoom in on very quickly now, with a lovely sepia map which at home on a white computer screen was beautiful, but on a yellow projector, sepia comes out very yellow. So this is Italy just here. You can just about see the boot of Italy. You can see Sicily down here. And then we've got, this is a, a map of the time. So we've got Asia Minor all around here. And we've got Greece, we've got Crete. This is Cyprus down here. And this is Syria. And this is modern day Turkey, which at the time was called Phrygia and Galatia, Cappadocia up here. Um, and if we can go to the next one, we can see Colossia just there, my very steady hand. Wow, that's bad, isn't it? Let's try that. That's even worse. <laughs> Colossia's down here. So we've got this little triangle here, and this triangle is called the Lycus Valley. I know, right? I'm a, I never did geography in my life. Um, it was a, river, a lovely river, and you've got Laodicea, Hierapolis, and Colossia. And that's really important. So there you go. We're there. We're right there in Colossia, right? That's worked. That's worked an absolute treat. You get the idea. We're in modern-day Turkey. It's hot. It's sandy. And as I say, this is a real letter to real people in this church in Colossia. And Colossia wasn't a big or an important town. It was upstaged by Laodicea, by Hierapolis, further up the, the, the Lycus Valley. Hierapolis was about six miles away. Laodicea was about ten miles away. So they're close enough for a day's walk. And Laodicea and Hierapolis were big towns. And we know that the church communities of these three towns mixed pretty regularly. In chapter 4 of the letter to Colossians, Paul says hi to, to Nympha, who runs the church in Laodicea. And we know that they all would have mixed together quite regularly, more regularly than we're allowed to mix these days, that's for sure. Thanks, Malcolm. I've got a little titter behind a face mask there. And the church in Colossia was really young at this point. It was planted by one of Paul's colleagues called Epaphras, who we meet. I don't know if we meet him this morning, but we definitely will meet him in the next few weeks. And as I say, it's dated usually around 60 AD, sometimes a bit earlier, sometimes around 53, 54 AD. But Paul was in prison when he was writing or dictating this letter. And let's just, let's just get that clear. 60 AD is 30 years, less than 30 years after Jesus has died. There is no Roman Catholic Church. There is no Church of England. There is no Bible. The recipients of this letter have got questions. They're a young church. They've been going for five, ten years. And we know that they've had trouble with false teachers. We know that they've been being taught things that are a bit not quite right. And Paul's going to put them right on this. And I also like to think that they probably had you know, normal, usual questions that we all have. Like, could you just run over the Trinity one more time for me? Because what? You know, things like that. And that's what this letter is all about. And Paul sent this letter, and I like to think that the people who were receiving this letter would have been absolutely buzzing to receive it. If you can imagine, you're sat in a coffee shop in Colossia. This isn't what I've written down. I'm ad-libbing, and I'm not normally allowed to ad-lib by my wife. Um, she just rolled her eyes at me. That's fine. Um, you're in a coffee shop in Colossia, You follow the way, which is what they call Christianity. You're counter to culture. You're counter to the Roman Empire. Let's remember the Roman Empire dealt with people who were contrary to what they said by killing them. And you hear that Paul's written this letter to the church. And that's the first time you've had any new teaching in ages. Oh my gosh, I'm absolutely buzzing. Where do I go and find this letter? Is it on Facebook? Thank you again for a few laughs. I don't know why I care about laughs. It's not important, Matt. This is why I don't ad-lib. I remember. 
The point is, these, the church is facing a number of issues. And what we want to get across is these are real people receiving this letter, written by Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, to the church in Colossia, but also to the church in Leamington Spa, St. Mary's. This was written for us as much as it was written for the Colossians. And that's so important. Let's see what this book opens with. If we could have the next slide up, Jonathan. So we're in Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. And it says, hopefully, yes. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to God's holy people in Colossia, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God, our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. Next slide, please, Jonathan. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. I'm going to welcome Becky up onto the stage now, who's going to unpick that passage for us and talk to us about what this is, what's all going on here. Can I pray for you? Heavenly Father, we thank you for Becky. We thank you for the gift you have given her. We thank you for her willingness to come and share your word with us today. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would fill her up and guide her tongue and guide her mind as she comes to unpick this for us. And we pray that we would have ears to hear and ears to listen. Amen. Amen. Hey, I'll just start with a prayer, if I may. Father, we do pray that you'll help us by your spirit to enjoy discovering more of you as we travel through the book of Colossians. We pray that you'll encourage us in our faith, in the word of truth, the good news of Jesus. Amen. So good. This, this service is amazing. The worship's been incredible. And so many of the topics in, in this book are in the worship. And I'm just like really pumped at the moment about how exciting Jesus is and that we're really lifting him high this morning. It's so exciting. And I'm excited that we're starting this new preaching series on the letter to the church in. Now, how on earth you pronounce it, I do not know. Um, I'll be honest. <laughs> is it Colossi? Is it Colossi? Is it Colossi? Um, we're not sure. It has one L, two S's. I found that out because I typed it wrong several million times. But anyway, we are, um, we are discovering this book. And before we dive into it, we're going to start by thinking about people who are important to us. So I need you to have your thinking hats on. I wonder, who are the people that support you in your faith? Are there people that you know are faithfully praying for you? Can you picture them in your mind's eye? Perhaps it's a children's worker. Maybe it's parents or relatives, a godparent, a friend, a mentor. Perhaps it's your small group friends that you meet with in the midweek. Also, who first told you the message of the gospel? Can you think of who that was? Who first told you about Jesus? Perhaps those people are still praying for you and they get excited when they hear about how your faith is being lived out. Well, let's keep those key people in mind because we'll come back to them later on. Because Paul was like them. He supported the faith of the Christians in Colossae and he was really thankful for the fruit of this gospel as he was praying for them. Perhaps for some of us, we're new, we're just visiting, perhaps we haven't yet heard a lot about Jesus. Well, I do hope that you'll stay with us in the coming weeks um, as we dive into this book of Colossians. The church was small in a rather cosmopolitan town, and it had been planted by Epaphras, who was from Colossae. He'd heard the message from Paul when he'd met him in Ephesus, and he'd taken it back home with him. 
You could think of it like receiving a seed and taking the message to go and plant it. And it is great to see the huge difference that the gospel message made. This word of truth of the gospel, as it's called in the letter, the truth of the good news about Jesus was carried. And when it was sowed, the seed that brought fruit brought faith and love and hope. And this fruitfulness excited Paul. Paul's mission, his purpose in life, was to spread the good news of this very powerful message about Jesus. And the people in Colossae were living surrounded by the Roman Empire. While a pretty scary Caesar was around, his name was Nero, and it wouldn't be all that long into the future before a terrible persecution would come upon the Christians. But in this letter, we discover that their identity is actually surrounded by something more awesome than the Roman Empire, specifically by someone who was more awesome, and that was Jesus. And during this preaching series, it might be a good idea for you to read a couple of other letters. There's a challenge, not only the short book of Colossians, but also why not read Ephesians and Philemon? because they would be great in helping you connect some of the themes and the background. And you could also read from Acts chapter 19 to the end, especially seeing what went on with Paul's experiences in Ephesus, and then later as he was eventually imprisoned in Rome, right at the end of that book. So I'm excited about the Bible, can you tell? This letter to the Colossians has lots to say about how we can live a prayerful, thankful, and fruitful life. And so that's one of the reasons why it's exciting to start off a new year studying this book, because we're going to find out how they were being taught to live out what they believed about Jesus in their everyday lives. And if you remember nothing else, then this letter is about being in Christ. Can you remember that? We repeat that. In Christ. In Christ. Brilliant. You're awake. And also, as well as being in Christ, it's about constantly having our minds on him, on Jesus who leads us. Christians are focused on the person of Jesus Christ. And we mentioned briefly baptism, at least um, Darren did at the beginning. When we were baptized, if we have been, our lives were buried with him so that our old life died as Jesus died for us on the cross. And then we were raised up, imagine coming up out of the water, raised up with him into new life. And that spiritual reality means that we are in Christ. And being in Christ makes all the difference. We've been made okay with God because of the cross and the resurrection. And we are being made more like Jesus in our daily lives. Paul says this about believers. He says, your life is now hidden in Christ, in God. In chapter 3, verse 3. And in Christ you have been brought to fullness. That's chapter 2, verse 10. And in him all things hold together. That's in chapter 1, 16 to 17. And in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives. That's 2, verse 9. So, It's like we're in this environment of Jesus, in him and he in us. That's cool, isn't it? I've got a, you can see it on the pictures up there. If you could just make out, there's the person in the middle is us, there's inside us is Jesus, and we at the same time are inside him. He's in us, and we're in him being in Christ and Christ in us. Can you see that in the picture? I've got another illustration that helps us to think about this idea, which is amazing. Imagine that you took a bucket and you submerged it into a river. So think about what would happen with the water in that river. Imagine it's the river of life. The bucket is in the water, and at the same time, the water is in the bucket. The bucket is in the river, and the river is in the bucket. So, if we are the bucket, we're in Jesus, that's the water, and he is in us. We're in the environment of Jesus and his life, and he is exalted in the heavenly realms. At the same time, he's in us. So, we're in the heavenly realms while he's in us. That's amazing, isn't it? Isn't that amazing? I think that's amazing. If we think of it another way, here's another way of imagining it, we are clothed in Christ. 
hidden in his beautiful robes. We had that in one of our songs in Cornerstone, didn't we? Those righteous robes. We are, may we one day be found in him, we sung. Well, we are in him. And one day we'll be hopefully found in him as we have faith in him. We're united with him in this special way. And I think that realization changes our expectations as we pray, knowing that we are sharing in the power of the resurrection. And it also changes how we live. It changes how we see others. We can treat one another as we would treat Jesus. We can be like Jesus to others. We are meant to be Jesus-shaped. And we can see Jesus in others. So out of all of this, love is a fabulous expression of the change that faith brings. The letter shows us how different their community could be because Jesus was in every Christian, whether they were Greek or Jewish, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. That's from Colossians chapter 3, verse 11. Whatever their background or their ethnicity. That's brilliant, isn't it? Everyone. I find myself often praying that I would be able to live more in step with Jesus, more cooperative with his spirit in me really letting him be Lord, and I want to honour him. And I wonder if you're similar. It's good that we had some time of confession earlier, because we often mess it up, don't we? But that is often our heart's desire. Well, this letter shows us the how for living a fruitful, abundant life. And crucially, it's by living in Jesus, who is the Lord, honouring him and being clothed in his nature, In other words, growing and becoming more like him because amazingly, the spiritual truth is we've already been united with him because of the cross and resurrection. We're living out what we spiritually already are. And that transformation comes because of belief in the word of truth about Jesus, the good news of the cross, where he made us friends with God. And in the letter, Paul teaches how to grow in Christian maturity how to grow up as a Christian, how to avoid false teaching. At the very center of this letter is this massively exciting truth that Jesus is our creator and reconciler with God. And awesomely, we've been raised with Christ. So the fact that he is the risen Lord and we are in him, raised with him, so somehow alive in the heavenly places, this means that life now here can also be so very different. We put on Christ and put off all the immorality and the idolatry. We clothed instead with Jesus and our lives get transformed through him. Imagine if we kept on remembering that Jesus is Lord of each and every believer in his church. He's the one who's made peace for us. And the amazing thing is we don't have to work ourselves up in trying to get close to God by our own means. We don't have to take on overly harsh spiritual practices to try to somehow control our own bodies. That's often called asceticism. Or get sucked into worldly philosophies as if all that we know is all that matters. Or mess around with mystical worship. Paul teaches them to avoid worshipping other things at the same time as Christ. No worshipping other gods, angels, philosophies, or other super spiritual ideas. It's about Jesus. Paul's letter reminds us that all we need is Jesus Christ. And we live out what we already have spiritually. Excitingly, this started to create a whole new kind of community in Colossae. They'd begun living the resurrection life, even in this life. That's cool, isn't it? One day we'll receive our resurrection bodies, but in the meantime, an abundant life has already started. And the fruits of this included the creation of a multi-ethnic, generous community who were called to being devoted to Jesus and to his ways. They were praised by Paul in those opening verses for their love for one another, and the truth was spreading all over the world. Importantly, for staying on track in faith, he told the church to set their minds on things above where the Messiah, Jesus, rules. Our minds get so easily distracted. I have a bracelet I'm wearing today, and it says on it, live as though heaven is on earth. There's a challenge. And that's only possible if we remain in Jesus with our minds set on the things that are above, on Jesus, on his rule, his ways, 
I wonder, are we willing to let his nature fill us and for him to lead us as Lord? So there is so much we already have spiritually. And being a Christian is all about Jesus. Not about anything that we might try to add on to the gospel. No, adding or taking away from what he's done for us. And that is a key way of avoiding error in our journey of faith. To keep the main thing the main thing, and the main thing is Jesus. We struggle with that naturally, because we love to do things our own way, ourselves. We can soon forget how precious that word of truth of the gospel actually is. And we try to work out other ways of connecting with God besides Jesus. But he is our everything. He's our only mediator. So who's truly Lord of our lives? Who and what are we surrounded by? Are we in the world but not of it? Who are we to be found in and who's in us? There are so many pressures to turn away from the good news and from Jesus' teachings. The risk, though, is that we begin to enslave ourselves, and that's not what Jesus came for. He's our creator, and he reconciles us with God, and that is life-changing. Obedience to him is life-giving. He is Lord, and his ways are the ways of self-sacrificial love, self-giving, compassion, kindness, gentleness, patience, forgiving others, love, and thankfulness. Talking of thankfulness, let's notice just how thankful Paul is at the start of the letter, because he's hearing good reports about them. He's really excited about their love in the spirit. So he starts with a long prayer of thanks. Do you know, I love prayer in evenings, because it gives me the chance to be thankful for the things that are good in my children's lives. And then I can let them know how proud I am of them for those good things that I've heard. I wonder if you remember times when your loved ones were happy because of the reports that they'd heard about you. The verses that we read today are the beginning of a prayer. It soon develops into a song of praise about how amazing Jesus is. Paul really loves Jesus. That's because Jesus is our everything. Paul is so thankful for the faith that has blossomed because of the word of truth of the gospel. And this word of truth has traveled to Colossae And he is happy that it's bearing some beautiful fruit, particularly in the way that they love, they hope, and they have faith. Those three fabulous hallmarks of the Christian church, faith, hope, and love. I've got a picture on the screen that shows you those in like jewelry, faith, the cross, love, the heart shape, and the anchor. We talked about the anchor being in the veil. Our anchor of hope is in the heavenly places. This faith and this love in Christ springs up from a hope that they have stored in heaven. There's a heavenly perspective, and they need to keep their minds on those things where Jesus rules. I wonder how much do we think about Jesus and our hope in heaven? Isn't it amazing that we are in him? How might knowing that we are hidden in Christ affect how we see ourselves? How do we see God knowing that we're hidden inside Christ? How might it help us to live loving, faithful lives as a church? So important to understand the true message of the grace-filled gospel. And when we do, the people who support our faith, do you remember those people you were thinking of earlier? Possibly even those who first brought you the truth will be so thankful in prayer as they hear the great reports about your faith and love in Christ. In Christ. This faith and love spring from the hope that he has stored up for us in heaven. The gospel bears fruit in Christian lives through how we live and how we share this message. And also in the numbers of people as the word of truth spreads. So who are you thankful for today? Who told you about Jesus? Maybe you could send them a thank you message today and encourage them by sharing the difference that knowing Jesus has made to you. Why not send them a text, write them an email, give them a phone call if you can. And if you are curious about Jesus, then please do have a chat with us. We'd love to help you consider him and to discover more about him. We could meet up for a coffee. I'd love that. 
How can we share the word of truth with people so that there might be more fruit of faith, love, and hope? Who have we told the word of truth to? I wonder if you've been in Epaphras by carrying the good news. Perhaps some of us have spent some time mentoring other Christians, encouraging them. Maybe we could do some of that this year. Find someone to encourage in the faith. Do you feel thankful when you pray for them? Let's pray for them this week and encourage them. And it is great to be in a small group where you can share in the faith of others around you. So think on who are the examples of faith, love, and hope for you. In this letter, Paul was praying for the church to have a wise understanding of the gospel and for the fruit of this hope. I've photocopied a cartoon of um, the letter (laughs) that you can take with you as you go. It's on the table at the back. Kind of help you as you read and you dive into Colossians in the coming weeks to get a sense of where you're at and what the letter's doing. Um, Hopefully you'll find that that helpful. That's from the Bible Project. You might even want to colour it in. Would be good, wouldn't it? (laughs) Take it home and in your prayer time, colour it in. Let's um, pray, shall we? Father, we thank you so much for Paul's letter to the Colossians. Thank you for the amazing truth that there is this word of truth that we can carry and that we can believe and that will make all the difference. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to remember the awesome truth that you're in us and we're in you and that you're in heavenly places. And may that make all the difference for our expectation of the transformation you want to bring to us, to our church, to the world around us. You want to do so many good things in so many lives. So would you just set us on fire with a fresh love for you, Jesus, and a deep focus on you. And may we submit to you in this coming year, trusting you to be Lord. Amen.